sample of Mike Farrell's books and found, most of all, an authentic, intelligent, compassionate, and reasonable person so far. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, he probably is best known for his portrayal of Army Captain B.J. Honeycutt uh, on the TV series MASH and Dr. Jim Henson in the series Providence. He has been actively involved over the years with Amnesty International, Greenpeace, Veterans Rights, he's a former Marine, the Environment, Animal Welfare, and Concern America, an international refugee and development organization. He's married to actress Shelley Fabre, whom he calls his hero. Since the title of one of his books is Just Call Me Mike, I am honored to introduce Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, thank you all uh, <clears throat> for being here, for that greeting, for that reception. I, uh, I have to say, and not having been here before, it feels a little like coming home. Um, there's, a, there's a warmth and a generosity of spirit here that is quite moving. The um, subject at hand is not a particularly pleasant one. Um, I am, as Susan suggested, best known for a character on television that brought laughs to people, and I, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that, but there aren't too many laughs in this particular subject, so hopefully during the question and answer period there will be some opportunity for a little more levity. Um, I am an abolitionist. I believe the death penalty is wrong. I believe that we serve uh, ourselves not by killing our citizens. Um, and I, I think that, unfortunately, the United States <clears throat> is uh, behind the uh, rest of the world in recognizing that uh, killing our citizens is the wrong thing to do. In an average um, room like this with Americans, uh, about six out of ten of you would be in support of the death penalty. That may or may not be the case here. Um, but the also, what, what isn't reported so much is that given the option of as the ultimate sanction of death or life in prison without the possibility of parole, of parole, the majority of Americans today prefer life without the possibility of parole. Politicians will not tell you that because politicians have found that it serves them ill to be considered soft on crime uh, and the way in which you are pointed out by certain people as being soft on crime is to oppose the death penalty and to oppose the harsher punishments and to believe that the, uh, in the capacity of human beings to transform their lives. Um, so it has become uh, um, politically advantageous in the last 40 years in this country to be uh, very supportive of harsh, draconian sometimes um, responses to lawbreaking and, uh, and in support of the death penalty. Uh, in the 50s and certainly in the 60s, the majority of the people in this country opposed the use of the death penalty. Um, and in my view, uh, around that time, because of what people on, uh, uh, in, in certain, uh, how do I characterize this without being political, people with um, a certain mindset um, began to f need to find something to make people frightened. And communism, the threat of commun communism, the, ac the accusation of communism or a fellow traveler or being pink if not quite red, uh, was losing its, um, its power. So they began to talk about being tough on crime. They began to talk about a permissive society. They began to talk about people that didn't understand the need to come down hard when uh, somebody acted out inappropriately. And that grew in, in um, acceptance and uh, in fervor uh, over the years to the point where in the 80s and 90s, about 85 to 90 percent of the people in the United States, if asked, would say they supported death, the death penalty. That, in my view, <clears throat> was because they were taught to be afraid, taught to believe that the only way they could be safe was to strike out at those people who were threatening. Um, over time, in the rest of the world, that view has changed, um, and people in most countries in the, in the, in the world today, uh, if, you, if you 
I don't know the numbers exactly, but if there are 190 recognized different sovereign nations in the country, about 160 of them have either given up the death penalty in law or in practice, and about 35 continue to use it, uh, the United States being one of them. Um, the unfortunate piece of that is that the company we keep as a result of that are companies, uh, countries like China and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and Iraq and uh, countries that whose human rights record we do not support generally. And being ourselves the self-anointed champion of human rights in the world, it puts us in kind of an odd situation. Um, but nonetheless, it is the case. Uh, we in the United States have refused, along with the Somalia, a country without a government, to um, sign on to the uh, covenant, international covenant for the, on the rights of the child, in part because it says no one should have the right to kill. In another part, it says no one should have the right to, uh, the children should have rights, uh, recognized rights of their own. Um, uh, we have refused to accept a, a couple of international covenants because of the fact that they claim that no country that signs this can continue to execute its citizens. In 19, just to give you, it's a big subject and we don't have a lot of time, so let me just give you a broad overview. In 1972, as a result of an attack by people who opposed the death penalty, the United States Supreme Court held that it did not meet constitutional standards and there was no death penalty in the United States from 1972 to 1976. When it was reinstated, uh, the um, stated reasons for its being held uh, without uh, constitutionality was that it was uh, <clears throat> um, geographically uh, applied differently in ge different geographic parts of the country. There were some as, uh, uh, suggestions that it was applied uh, disproportionately racially uh, and uh, from the point of view of economics, uh, poor people were more likely to be executed than rich people. And uh, it, that it was uh, freakishly applied. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was um, uh, likened to being struck by lightning as to who would be given the death penalty and who would not. So they, they said that there, as it stood, there could not be a death penalty. This was in 1972, the, the Furman decision. In 1976, the state of Georgia brought to the court a, uh, a, a way to fix that. <clears throat> and the court accepted it. It built in certain safeguards that they said had to, were required to meet constitutional muster in order to protect the rights of the accused. And uh, with those safeguards built in, the death penalty became once again constitutionally acceptable and we have been practicing it now for the last, what is that, seven, since 76, 30, what, six years, five years. Um, and I have opposed the death penalty for before it was held unconstitutional and since that time and the <clears throat> abolitionist movement has grown over time. Um, I now chair an organization called Death Penalty Focus which has been dedicated to the abolition of the death penalty along with a number of other organizations around the country and in other parts of, of, the, of the world uh, that work in support of the abolition of the, of the death penalty. And we have pointed out and continue to point out to people that the death penalty is still applied uh, uh, racially, uh, disproportionately. Uh, uh, po a population, a black population in the United States that numbers about 11 percent and the number of black people on death row is about 36 uh, percent. Number of Hispanics, uh, I don't know what the population number is, but the, uh, the, the fact is that people of color are the vast majority of people on death row in this country. And virtually all the people on death row in this country are people of poverty, people who had, uh, didn't have the money to hire a dream team to defend them and therefore um, get off or get a lighter sentence, as we know has happened on the parts of those who, who can. So racism and classism, if you will, continue to pollute our death system. Um, and those are arguments that have brought the American people to a little more thoughtful position on the death penalty. <clears throat> the next issue that came up was innocence. Uh, and it was demonstrated a, 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 an organization that, uh, with which my organization worked in tandem 
put together a um, conference in uh, Chicago at the uh, Northwestern Law School in 1998, where we brought together 36 of the then 76 men and women who had been charged, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death, and spent many years, in some cases, in, in, uh, on death row, waiting to be executed. And in some cases, coming within hours of execution, before being found to be not guilty of the crime and exonerated and freed. And it was, a, it was a thunderstroke in the community and in the country and, in fact, in the world to see these human beings stand up and say, if, it, if the state of California, if the state of Texas, if the state of Virginia, if the state of Florida, if the state and went through the, this litany had had its way, I would be dead today and instead they were there and they were attesting their support for the abolition of the, of the death penalty. Uh, today, that number, 76, has been expanded to the point that it is now 139 human beings who have been tried, convicted, and sentenced to death, who have been discovered, thankfully, by the work of, in some cases, students, lawyers, nuns, um, people of concern, family members, who have brought to, to the uh, uh, courts demonstra demonstrable proof of innocence or questions enough to have seen that these people are exonerated. So the question of the innocent being sentenced to death has raised the attention of the people in this country. Uh, now the question becomes how many were innocent and were executed? Uh, and that is a subject that can be gone into in some detail but the primary case, um, actually a, a recent case of Troy Davis in Georgia, uh, uh, argues that there was no convincing evidence to suggest he was guilty, and he in fact professed his innocence up to the day he died, uh, and that's true of a number of cases. Um, uh, but there is a case uh, in Texas today, a man by the name of Cameron Todd Willingham was executed in the late 90s under the uh, aegis of the current uh, uh, man who was running for president, uh, Governor uh, uh, Perry of Texas, um, uh, executed for a, an arson murder that killed his three children. He always maintained his innocence. He said the fire was set. He doesn't know how, um, but it happened spontaneously. Uh, he was tried, convicted, as I said, sentenced to death and executed. Uh, sub to, subsequent to that time, experts in the issue of, in the area of fire science have examined the evidence and said there is no evidence that that fire was set by arson. In fact, it was set as a result of an, uh, a faulty electrical connection. Uh, Willingham's children died in that fire and he tried valiantly to save their lives. Um, but nonetheless, he was executed for uh, what was claimed to be their murder. Um, the governor of Texas is going doing backflips today to try to cover the fact that he allowed an innocent man to be executed, and he's doing so. He has done so by um, using his power, um, and it, it is. I don't want to go through the whole thing and indict him, but the point is that what I find in examining this subject is something that I think of as an uh, an institutional imperative that suggests we don't want to know if somebody was actually executed who was innocent because it calls into question the validity of the system. It also subjects the jurisdiction, whatever it is, state, county, or whatever, to the possibility of, uh, of uh, great uh, charges brought against them and great costs being, um, being generated. There have been multi-million dollar settlements from uh, people who have been wrongly convicted and, and incarcerated and threatened with death and ultimately freed, but those who have been executed don't have that opportunity to sue the state. So what we have today is a system that is broken, that is inefficient, that is, uh, in my view, wrong, but I hold uh, my own moral view is that it's wrong to kill. I believe that people have the capacity to transform their lives. I have been part of organizations that have worked with people and have seen extraordinary, extraordinary things in terms of human, human ability to change. I believe there's always a reason for human behavior and that we as a society that is civil, 
need to recognize that uh, people have the capacity uh, innately to be better than some of them demonstrate an ability to be. So I think we have a big job to do in this society, and one of the things we have to begin to do is recognize the innate humanity, the innate value, the innate dignity, the innate goodness that is ours by birthright as human beings. Uh, I think of it as the innate spark of divinity. Uh, some friends of mine who don't accept the whole concept of divinity are content to think of it as the innate spark of humanity. I'm fine with that. Call it what you like. Um, but we need to, to recognize that we are going down an, an, an ugly and, I think, irreparable path if we do not reverse it. And I am with um, Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, who says to dehumanize another is to dehumanize ourselves. It's my view. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I, I read recently that the, um, during the Second World War, during the early days of the Second World War, when the Nazis were um, gathering uh, Jews and homosexuals and gypsies and not uh, communists and collaborators that they felt were threats to them, uh, they would imprison them, they would then set them out, line them up before a trench that had been dug behind them. And some of the Nazi troopers would machine gun them. They would fall backward into the trench, and dirt would be bulldozed over them, and it would become a mass grave. And the Nazi high command put out a notice that they said they were concerned about the burdening of the soul of the troopers who were doing the machine gunning. The Nazi high command recognized the damage that these people were doing to themselves by executing other human beings, innocent or otherwise, but um, helpless human beings. And it is my view that we in this society are allowing ourselves to be damaged. We are allowing our moral fabric to be unstrung as a result of standing by and allowing the state to kill in our name, because the state kills in our name. 36, uh, 34 now states in this country kill. 16 do not, as a result of recent actions in Georgia, I'm sorry, as a result of recent actions in New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, and Illinois, there is no more death penalty there. For many years, it was, there were 12 states that did not have a death penalty. Today, there are 16. And if my organization has its way, next year, California will stop using the death penalty. And I'm here to announce that we are putting on the ballot an initiative uh, that we hope will be on the 2012, November 2012 ballot that will call for an end to the death penalty, uh, replacing it with life in prison without the possibility of parole, and requiring that a uh, recent study has shown that we spend, in the, in the state of California, we spend $184 million every year over and above the cost it would take to put somebody in prison and keep him or her there for the rest of his or her natural life simply to maintain the death system. In a state that has a $20 billion deficit, $184 million a year seems to me to be a lot of money that could be saved and could be used to put more police on the streets, could be used to save the jobs for teachers, could be used to save the jobs for nurses, could be used to save the programs for dependent children that are being stripped by the budgetary considerations that are being bandied about in Sacramento today. So we are intending to end this practice. And for those of you who wish to join us, uh, there will be petitions to be signed uh, uh, in the very near future uh, to put this initiative on the ballot. The, uh, the polls we've taken argue to us that we will succeed if we can get um, enough people to understand exactly what is, uh, what is available to them. So um, what I don't want to do is suggest to people that because my morality argues that we harm ourselves by harming others, my morality suggests it's wrong to kill. I know there are those, perhaps the, among here, uh, this, organ, this group, that say under certain circumstances, my morality says it is appropriate for the state to take a life. And, and I don't want to suggest that my morality is higher than those of you who believe that way. But what I do suggest is that those of you who believe that way 
must require that the system you use or your state uses to take a life be perfect, be one that is not racist, be one that is not uh, classist, it is not only used against the poor, be one that does not capture and execute the innocent, be one that is fair and even in the cases of, in my view, even in the cases of one who is demonstrably innocent, prove, uh, uh, guilty, uh, 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 a, uh, 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 one who con confesses to a crime and says, I did this horrible thing, that we do not proper, uh, profit by taking that individual's life when we can put that person in prison where we will be safe from him or her and they will be safe from themselves um, for the rest of their natural lives. In either way, that individual will die in prison. The question is whether God does it, if you accept that God does anything, nature does it, or um, the state does it. So in my view, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain by ending the use of the death penalty. And I'd be happy to take your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you.